Almighty God, we eagerly await your word for, uh, for us this morning. May our minds be open to learn, our hearts willing to change, and our hands ready to serve. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So this week we pick up the story of the Israelites after they were liberated from slavery in Egypt. The Israelites celebrated their God-given freedom, right? They had a festival with food and singing and dancing, and they gave thanks and praise to their Lord. It was a joyous occasion. And then what? Then Moses led the tribe of Israel out into the wilderness and towards the place where he first encountered God in the burning bush on Mount Sinai. The Israelites walked about 200 miles in the desert. During that long, hot march, the people complained and they whined. They were hungry and thirsty and they wanted to go back to Egypt, back to slavery, because at least they wouldn't starve to death. They didn't like their living conditions and they were testing the Lord. And of course, the Lord came through. The Lord provided for the people and sent manna from heaven for them to eat and gave them water from a rock to drink. In the end, they learned the lesson that they can trust God to provide what they need, right? They can rely in God's providence. God knows what they need and cares and will take care of his people. So after three months of marching through the desert, the Israelites finally reached Mount Sinai and they set up camp at its base. And they were there for about a year while Moses would hike up Mount Sinai and talk with God. The Bible says they spoke face to face as if one-on-one. -on -one. And God's presence would be manifest when Moses went up. They would, uh, this great display of power and authority, there'd be smoke and lightning and thunder and fire to let people know that God's holy presence was there. God's glory one time uh, covered Mount Sinai for six days as he revealed to Moses the Ten Commandments. And God gave Moses two stone tablets with the commandments written by the finger of God. The stone tablets were placed into the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ten Commandments now are the foundation of biblical ethics, right? They're a very important, uh, I want to say document, but they're not a document, they're a stone. They're very important to the foundation of biblical ethics, and they actually f uh, form the framework of the laws we have today in modern society. So they're extremely important, yes? So do you know what they are? If I gave you a blank piece of, hold, well, you beat me to it, but if I gave you a blank piece of paper, would you be able to write them down? Yeah, I, I would struggle. I probably could get them. I don't know if I can get them in order, and I don't know if I can get them exactly right. And yet we know, we know they're really important, but we uh, don't always know what they are. And so we're gonna spend a little bit of time. I'm not gonna uh, take them up, like dissect them for you, but I'm just gonna walk through them kind of quickly. The first four are this. You shall have no other God, no other gods before me. Number two, you shall not make for yourself an idol. Number three, you shall not misuse God's name. And number four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So the first four out of 10 are specifically our relationship with God, right? They're about recognizing that God is God and we are not, right? We are people. And so it puts us in our place in the universe that we should show the proper respect and reverence and awe for God we should worship God. We should not uh, disrespect God by how we use God's name. We should not have other idols. We shouldn't uh, allow other parts of our lives to take over our pursuit of idols like uh, prosperity and property and power and prestige and all those P words. That's an easy way to remember it, by the way. It's the P words, power, property, prestige, and possessions. And we often make those things idols and we don't even mean to, but it gets us off course. And so the first four commandments remind us God should be at the center of our lives. We should base how we live on God's will, and we should respect and honor God and worship God. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, um, and that's the foundation of the Ten Commandments. Okay, the next six, five through ten, are about our relationships with each other. So honor your father and mother is number five. You shall not murder is number six. Number seven is you shall not commit adultery. Number eight is you shall not steal. Number nine is you shall not testify falsely. And number 10 is you shall not covet your neighbor's things. Again, pretty straightforward, right? Don't lie, cheat, steal, or murder. It's about how we treat one another. Pretty foundational, pretty important stuff. The 10 commandments are really the building blocks of civilization. 
The Ten Commandments are the basic ethical human interactions we should have. The Ten Commandments form a social contract so that we're able to live with other human beings. Important stuff. And God knows, as human beings, we need rules, right? Without the law, society would descend into chaos. Human nature is bent towards sinful behavior. Humanity is driven by these powerful forces inside of us of greed and lust and anger and violence, and they need to be contained and shaped by God's law. We need rules, amen? Yeah, for sure. So God gave us the Ten Commandments as a way of setting limits, as a way of creating healthy boundaries, and God did this out of love, right? As any loving parent would do, you give, you give your children healthy boundaries and limits because you want to see them flourish and do well. God knew that if we want to experience the healthy, the blessing of a healthy, loving relationship, that we needed these laws so that we could have a strong community and strong families, and we could experience the joy of abundant life. It's very clear. In fact, it's so clear that it's the very first psalm. If you um, turn to Psalm number one, it just lays it out right there in beautiful language. It says, blessed are those whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And all in, on his law, they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season. And their leaves do not wither. And in all they do, they prosper. Isn't that beautiful? Sounds simple enough, right? Just follow God's laws and you'll have an awesome life. Piece of cake. Easy enough. I don't know if I mentioned, though, that uh, the commandments are just the top 10 laws. Uh, God revealed 613 laws to Moses. Did you know that? 613 laws. We have trouble <laughs> remembering 10. <laughs> Oh, man. And I have some bad news for you. We've already broken a bunch of them. We all do it all the time. Because uh, not all laws are equal. Some are more about social norms. But if you've had a, a cheeseburger, you violated one of the laws because you've mixed dairy with meat. If you wore a polyester cotton blend uh, shirt or dress, you violated one of the laws. If you worked on a Sunday, if you talked back to your parents, if you cut your hair on the sides, you're violating the law if you eat bacon, right? I love bacon. I, yesterday, in fact, I had a whole mess of pork yesterday. So I definitely violated one of these 613 laws. I would have had more pork, but I had six ears of Sylvester corn, which is so tasty. How many of you have been enjoying Sylvester corn, right? Um, but yeah, so eating that pork, I'm in big trouble. I mean, can you imagine though, if we had to follow every law to the letter of the law in order to win God's favor, in order to somehow earn eternal life. Can you imagine if salvation was like this merit-based system where we, where we had to be perfect to achieve the goal? None of us could do it, right? It's impossible. So if none of us can follow the law perfectly, then maybe the law is just not that important, right? It's kind of that Old Testament stuff. Right? I mean, Jesus came to replace that Old Testament system of law with a new system of grace, so we don't need to worry about the laws. Right? Oh, I can't fool you guys. You're with me. No, absolutely not. In fact, Jesus is very clear. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. The law is good. The law is something we need. The law is not the problem. The problem is sin. When we violate God's law, we experience the negative consequences. Because of sin, our relationship with God and our relationship with our loved ones, our relationship with our community and society gets stretched and strained until it starts cracking and breaking. Because of sin, we become separated from God and separated from one another. We are not able to repair that damage. We need a savior, amen? Jesus came to fulfill the law and to save us from our sins. 
Jesus' death on the cross fulfills the law by providing us with a pardon for our sin. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross grants us with the gift of grace and forgiveness we so desperately need and cannot give ourselves. Jesus' self-giving love restores our relationship with God and with each other. We are people who have been redeemed. It's wonderful news. And so by the power of God's grace at work within us, we are called to live by a higher law, the law of love, the law of God's grace. It's much higher than just the Ten Commandments. And Jesus said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Can you remember that much? Love God and love your neighbor. Go and do it. Amen.